first steps in seeing. Uh, I'll discuss the uh, visual processing that takes place in the retina, and I'll discuss subcortical visual pathways, and I'll give a brief introduction to color vision, because Professor Mitra thinks you all should know at least something about how animals see color because of the great importance, of course, of uh, color in machine vision. Uh, my lecture will be in three parts. Uh, first of all, uh, retinal processing of uh, the visual scene. Then I'll speak about subcortical pathways, visual pathways, and then give an introduction to color vision. And I will uh, pause after each of these topics uh, to allow for questions. Is that possible from the audience? Well, I guess I can't hear it yet. We'll see if we can sort, if we can sort out a microphone. I'm very happy to take questions. I've also given um, Sveta a, uh, a PDF file containing the images of these uh, slides I will show you and with some uh, lecture notes. I hope that you've all been able to uh, receive that. Okay, let's begin. Uh, what you see here is a human retina. It's from a, it's donor tissue. It's been removed from the eye by my colleague Dennis Stacy at the University of Washington in Seattle. And in, in its natural shape, of course, the retina is approximately hemispherical. And here you can see that these, uh, the structure has been um, cut along these lines here, partially cut, to relieve the, semi, the hemispherical nature and allow it to lie almost uh, flat in the dish. Uh, we all know, we're, f we're familiar from high school, of course, that the, the visual world is imaged on the retina. Here are two important parts of the human retina. One is the optic disc. All animals, all mammals have an optic disc. This is the place where fibers, output fibers from the retina uh, go into the optic nerve. And this point here is exclusive to the retina of humans and diurnal primates, that is di primates which are active during the day. And this structure here is called the fovea. And I'll be spending some time discussing the fovea because it, although it is a very tiny part uh, of your retina, it is functionally the most important part. Even though it is only one millimeter across, if you lose this, this part of the retina, then you are functionally blind. So it's obviously important for us to understand that. Uh, let me just go back. So I'll show you as we proceed, I'll show you two views uh, of the retina. One is if you imagine looking down onto the structure as you're looking down here, and we could focus then at different levels of the structure. I'd call that a flat or a whole mount view. Another view is to imagine looking along the edge of one of these cuts. If you imagine that, then that's the view that you're about to see. I'll also call that a, a vertical or radial view. <coughs> So the retina turns light into neural signals and nerve signals. And these signals, the signals going out of the retina, are trains of action potentials. And I will discuss that in a little bit more, a little bit more in a little while. But most of the neural uh, processing within the retina is by means of graded changes in membrane potential uh, in these cellular structures. The retina comprises layers of uh, nerve cells. The outermost layer, that is the layer that's furthest away from the light coming in. Imagine the light coming in from underneath this picture here. These comprise the rods and cones. Cones are for daytime vision and rods are for nighttime vision. The signals from receptors are transmitted to another set of neurons. I'll call them post-receptoral neurons because they're past receptors. And these are the so-called bipolar cells. This is a simplistic view here. I'll show you more detail in a little while. And so these cells transmit signals from the photoreceptors down into what we call the inner layers of the retina. The next stage is the bipolar cells contact cells called retinal ganglion cells. 
And these cells, the ganglion cells, are the output stage of the retina. You can see here, these are the axons of these cells, of these neurons. And so these transmit uh, information, transmit signals uh, across the retina and down into the optic nerve. So, in summary, light goes in, it's processed in the retina, the signals are processed in the retina, and action potentials go out. So everything that you see when you open your eyes and look around the world, everything that you see is based on the uh, signals being sent down your optic nerve as encoded as trains of action potential. So our job is to find out what is that code, uh, what, is it, what cells are doing what parts of the code, uh, how many cell types are there, and what are the important things in the real world that these cells can signal. In addition to this pathway here from receptors to horizontal cells to ganglion cells, there are also other cell types in the retina which make more widespread connections. I hope you can see here this green, these green processes. They extend across multiple receptors. These are so-called horizontal cells. And then another um, variety of cells called amacrine cells. Amacrine means lacking an axon, lacking a long process. And these make connections, lateral connections, within uh, the, this, uh, like this, in this region where bipolar cells contact ganglion cells. <clears throat> so you can see already before the um, signals from, from the photoreceptors are sent uh, into the brain, uh, there is a lot of processing that takes place. Okay, I'm showing you this slide to point out that uh, these two, here are two creatures that look extremely different. These are vertebrates. Uh, here's a non-mammalian vertebrate, a tiger salamander. Uh, here's a primate uh, from South America, a capuchin uh, monkey, a species with a visual system very much like yours or I, you or me. But the, the nevertheless, although these animals look almost completely different, you can see they both have eyes, and amazingly enough, the retinas of these two very different creatures show very striking similarities. So evolution has conserved the cell types and, uh, and the main cell types and their connections within the retina. Let's just briefly compare the structure of the retina of these two species. You can see here in these histological sections, here are receptors in the tiger salamander. Here are bipolar and endocrine cells. Here are ganglion cells, the output layer. And look here in the, in, the, in the monkey. Here is a receptor layer. Many more receptors. You see they're very tightly packed here. Here are the bipolar and uh, cells, horizontal cells and endocrine cells. And here, down here, are the output layers, the output ganglion cells. So the cells in this animal are much smaller than they are in tiger salamander. There are many, many more of them, but yet the basic structure, uh, basic function, uh, functional connectivity is preserved. Sorry. <clears throat> Let's just go back for a second. Now I'm going to show you a whole mount view, a horizontal view, looking down onto the mosaic of cones, and we'll be looking uh, in a primate retina. So what you'll see is a mosaic, of, if you imagine looking along a line, along this uh, section here, you'll be looking down onto the retina. And here you can see the very beautiful uh, mosaic of cone receptors. You can see they're spaced in a very regular way. And here in between, I hope you can also see the uh, rod, uh, outer segments of the rod photoreceptors. Is that clear? So that's structure. Let's talk now about function, because function is what breathes life into structure. We need to know the function, uh, or the functional characteristics of this, uh, of this little uh, piece of brain. The retina, in fact, is uh, functionally up-pocketing of the brain, and we've learned an awful lot about how the brain processes in information by learning how the retina processes information. Now, here's a famous experiment from uh, Trevor Lamb uh, and, and colleagues. 
and Dennis Baylor and colleague, where you can see on the right, this is an excised piece of uh, toad retina. So here are some cells. These are there's a bunch of nerve cells. Here, I hope you can see these rod-like structures. These are the rod photoreceptors. And here, this structure here, this is a micro electrode. So a single receptor has been sucked up into this electrode. I hope you can see it there. That's the outline of it there. And so this medium here is electrically isolated from this medium here. So any current that flows across this membrane of the receptor here can be measured. It will be visible as a potential difference between this, between the inside of the, of the electrode and the outside of the electrode. So let's see what happens when we illuminate this single receptor here. We pass a beam of light through this membrane. We can calculate how much light there is. And we can see uh, how a single receptor responds to light. And it looks something like this. Here's our first uh, graph for today. Here is time on the uh, x-axis, so each mark is one second. Uh, this lower trace here shows the output of a photocell, so that's measuring the light. That's what's going into the system. And this, um, the y-axis here is the membrane potential of a single receptor. And we see that at, um, in the absence of light, this uh, membrane potential of this cell of this neuron, unlike most other neurons, is relatively uh, it's relatively depolarized. It's about minus 40 millivolts. You know, of course, that the resting potential of nerve cells is close to minus 70 millivolts. And here, shortly after the uh, this receptor is illuminated, we see a sudden drop in membrane potential. The receptor is hyperpolarized by the light stimulus. You can see here, of course, some interesting things happening. Already you can see that the change is not instantaneous. There is a short delay. So this is a biological process. So even measured at a time scale of seconds, there are delays between the um, input and the output. You can see here this, pro this um, peak here is coming nearly two seconds after the light, uh, after the illumination is turned on. And you can see here another interesting thing. Note that the, the illumination continues yet the receptor starts to re to, um, to, uh, to, to repolarize again. So the response is only a very vague emulation of what's going on in the physical world. And then we see something else that's very interesting, that even after the receptor, the light is extinguished, uh, the receptor, this repolarization continues very slowly for a number of seconds. So although the receptor is telling us, tell, can tell the brain something about the light intensity in the outside world, uh, the message that it's sending uh, hasn't really got much resemblance uh, to, uh, to the physical stimulus. Now I know that many of you have engineering backgrounds and you might like to think of these, these systems uh, as an engineer would uh, analyze a system. And indeed, physiologists like to pretend that they're engineers sometimes and they will analyze a system by changing the intensity, not as a step function here, but as a sine function, a nice simple function, change the constant rate so it can change the intensity sinusoidally. And, in the, and then we would see that the membrane potential of the cone would also change in a sinusoidal fashion uh, with some delay due to the time uh, taken to the activation. But we could get this work this system as a, in a using a stationary signal and get a stationary signal out uh, of the system. And now what I'm showing you here is the output signal from a single cone photoreceptor. That is that the uh, that, that is the release of neurotransmitter called glutamate from the receptor. The higher the membrane potential of the receptor, the uh, lower the release of glutamate. So the glutamate is released release is highest when the membrane potential is lowest is, is highest here and so it's approximately you see approximately an inverted version of the light intensity so when intensity goes down glutamate release goes up so that's how the cone can tell the rest of the retina what's happening out there in the outside world and this is a nice way of analyzing the system a nice simple way of analyzing the system 
So light goes into the receptors and glutamate comes out of the receptors and now you understand uh, some the basic uh, function of that uh, process. I won't, we won't uh, deal with the fascinating uh, biochemical details that occur, which is this, that is this process of phototransduction. Um, that's uh, for now, uh, we, we, we can just treat this as a sort of an input output uh, system. Now, what happens next? Remember, I introduced you to the idea of receptor cells, rods and cones. Here are bipolar cells in the retina, and here is a ganglion cell. So we can trace the signal flow starting here through bipolar cells, through ganglion cells, and then off to the brain. We've learned that uh, the light is transformed into glutamate release here at this synapse here between cones, uh, between receptors, and bipolar cells. So let, let's look at this next step in a little more detail. Right, so we, we call this pathway, receptors to bipolar cells to ganglion cells, we call it vertical pathway. Remember, I, I said this is a, like a, we call this a vertical view of the retina. And in addition, I remember I introduced you to uh, other lateral pathways, that is pathways that connect multiple receptors and can influence. So this bipolar cell could be influenced uh, by receptors a long way away by way of these horizontal connections. So the vertical pathway is mostly we call excitatory, depolarizing a bipolar cell could depolarize a, a depolarizing a receptor could depolarize a bipolar cell could depolarize a ganglion cell. But this uh, this pathway, this vertical pathway, is modified by the horizontal connections within the retina. Now, if you're an engineer, you probably wouldn't build a retina like this. You might just decide to use um, one kind of inhibitory cell and one kind of excitatory cell, but this is not engineering, it's biology. Okay? It's been, it hasn't been designed, it's a product of evolution, and you need to keep that in mind. It's a very important thing to understand when you want to understand uh, information or signal processing in the brain as opposed to the computer chip. So here's a basic structure, here's our uh, Structure. Let's look in detail at the synapse between cones and bipolar cells. So here's our second big lesson for today. That is that there are not just one kind of bipolar cells, there are multiple kinds or subtypes of bipolar cells. Here we're showing them to you in experiments from Thomas Euler and Heinz Wessler in that retina. And they could find that there are different types of bipolar cells, distinct types, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different types of bipolar cell contacting cones, and one type of bipolar cell that contacts rods. On the right, you can see responses to a step of light of, the, of two different bipolar cells. And this shows us a major difference a major division in retina processing, and that is between bipolar cells which are hyperpolarized by glutamate. In other words, you see they're hyperpolarized by glutamate and hyperpolarized by light. Because these cells have receptors that are hyperpolarized by glutamate. So when the glutamate release is highest, dark, they are depolarized. That's, excuse me, they're hyperpolarized, right? So these cells respond not to light onset, they're excited by light offset. They're hyperpolarized by light onset. So these are called off-type bipolar cells. If you think of the membrane potential as being a switch, these ones are switched off by light. Here's another set of bipolar cells, and these cells express a different kind of receptor. In this case, we're uh, popping glutamate on, and you can see here that the and glutamate release is increased, that is, um, then these cells are depolarized. So these are on-type bipolar cells. They're depolarized by glutamate, okay, and um, they respond to light onset. And uh, you can see here that they live in different parts of the uh, inner plexiform layer, 
these cells all stratify up here, and these down here. But that's that's a just a anatomic of these. Uh, the, the, the main point is that there are different functional types, and they form distinct parallel pathways in the visual system, starting at the very first synapse. All these cells, different cells, they all hook on to the same cone and draw the cable. So here's our on bipolar cells, they're depolarized by light, and off bipolar cells are uh, hyperpolarized by light. So this is the start of on and off pathways in the visual system. Uh, here's an example from now from uh, monkey retina. Here's just one type of bipolar cell, that's this type here, uh, the so-called um, flat midget bipolar cell, and we can uh, stain them using antibodies by stealing methods from immunology to um, label uh, epitopes on the membrane of these cells that are only expressed by these cells. And you can see here there's a very beautiful array, very dense array of bipolar cells in uh, monkey retina. Each one of these bipolar cells contacts a single cone receptor uh, in the monkey retina. And you can see here it's sending its process down into the inner plexus. So that was our vertical pathway showing you um, now you you know a bit more about that, this you can understand now even though i've shown a single bipolar cell type here there are multiple parallel arrays there are on and off arrays and within each of these arrays there are subdivisions let's look now at the next stage of visual processing and here i'm showing you a, a, a diagram to explain how we can uh, monitor the output of the retina. So we can monitor ganglion cell activity. Remember I showed you that the ganglion cell axons and ganglion cell bodies are closest to the inner surface of the retina. And so by using modified uh, instruments from ophthalmology, we can uh, make a little uh, waterproof uh, system, put an electrode, uh, insert an electrode into the eye of an anesthetized uh, animal, and we can use the intact eye, the intact system, and we can display stimuli in the outside world. We can modify the outside world. In this case, we can show a picture of a delicious banana, and that image of that point will be uh, focused by the eye's optics, by the lens of cornea, onto a certain position in the retina, which corresponds to the position of the object in the visual world. And because the ganglion cells are closest to the inner surface of the retina, they're the first ones that they, we strike when we push, uh, when we lower an electrode onto the surface of the retina. Now, this is the way that we can um, measure the impulses coming from individual ganglion cells. And this is the kind of thing that we see. So here is a function of time. And you can see here, notice here the time scale is uh, much, uh, far more rapid and in the example I showed you, the receptor signal from an invertebrate retina, so this is a vertebrate retina, um, and uh, you can see here these individual events. So this is in absence of any stimulus. This is ongoing activity uh, of a single uh, neuron, and you can see here these, these these events. They're very very rapid. They only last for less than uh, they last for less than one millisecond. And so we can take this complicated signal here. We can filter it to center the, uh, the, the center the filters uh, on the frequencies in these individual spikes here. We call them spikes or action potentials. And so we can filter it and amplify it here. And now we've got a signal in volts, and, and it's nice and flat. And here uh, uh, on the expanded scale are shown these action potentials. They're all very uh, stereotyped. And so now we could use a um, we could use a triggering device to simply say every time. The signal goes up over one volt. We'll count that as one spike, as one event, as one neural event. And then we can discriminate these pulses and then treat these, these uh, unitary events as a time series. Because remember, as I told you, everything that you see is based on trains of action potentials passing through your optic nerve. So if we understand what these action, how these action potentials relate to the outside world, we can understand a lot about the early stages 
let's look now at a on face view, a horizontal view of a, an individual ganglion cell in cat retina as we place spots of light at different positions on the retina uh, around the neighborhood of this ganglion cell. So now we're looking down on the retina. Remember, I showed you a mosaic of receptors, and now I'm showing you a single ganglion cell. And over here, you see the record of action potentials as spots of light are placed at different distances from the center of the cell's uh, collecting zone or dendritic field. I hope you've learned about that neurons have dendrites. Neurons have dendrites they where they collect input and they have an axon that gives the output. So here is the uh, records from the soma or axon of the cell. So you see here, if a spot of light is a long way away from the cell body here, from the cell, then we see an ongoing steady stream of uh, spikes, but this, the, uh, this stream is not interrupted or not changed um, by the by a change in intensity, that increase here. If we move the cell to this position here, a bit closer, but not yet inside the dendritic field, then we see that as when light turns on, the cell is actually inhibited. The ongoing activity is reduced. And when the light is extinguished, the activity briefly increases above the background level. Now we put, this, uh, put our spot of light, our stimulus over here, near the center of the dendritic field, and we see the ongoing activity is greatly increased, it's greatly increased uh, for the duration of the, of the stimulus. So is this an on-center cell or an off-center cell? Anybody want to have a guess? Raise your hand if you think it is an on-center cell. Raise your hand if you think it is an off-center cell. Well, I can't see your hands, but I guess I, guess, I hope that many of you have real, said it's an off an off an on type cell. It has an on center, the central area here, but this on center is surrounded by a region which has the opposite shows the opposite polarity of response to light. So we can imagine, you know, marching this this spot of light in different directions, and we could map out here. We're mapping out in two dimensions. The intent, the response of this cell, relative to background level, and we could imagine making a making a three-dimensional uh, map of the sensitivity of the cell. Just briefly, how does this measurement actually? Where does this measurement come from? Remember, the what happens is that uh, the intracellular potential changes rapidly with every single action potential. So, if we forget the fancy stuff inside the cell, we see a change from minus seventy. To nearly plus 10 millivolts, and very briefly thereafter, a, re a, a turn back uh, to minus 70 millivolts for a, for, a, uh, for a ganglion cell. So it changes rapidly with every action. So when during this time, the local field potential, so if the cell is negative, then it quickly becomes, suddenly becomes positive inside, and then it returns to inside being more negative. So this, uh, these currents that flow across the membrane cause changes in the local field potential. These changes drop with the cube of the distance from the membrane. But if an electrode is if an electrode is close enough to the cell, not even inside it, but close enough to sense this change uh, in field, then we can record the action potential. So that's the basis of extracellular recording. Okay, let's a look here on the left. There's a famous figure, figure of the, uh, from 1953, before any of you were born. I know I was in primary school. I know, wait a minute, I wasn't even born in 1953, before even I was born. First recordings of a ganglion cell receptive field. Here is the electrode retina. And here, Stephen Kufler is mapping out places which show increases in action potential and places which show decreases in firing. There's an, an on center cell and an intermediate zone that shows some sort of combination, plus uh, and minus. And you can see the field is roughly uh, circular, very roughly. 
and the zones are roughly concentric. The center is roughly concentric here with the surround. Uh, here is a slightly more advanced version. Here I was alive uh, in 1965. I was in primary school. And here you see a computer con one of the first uses of uh, a computer control to uh, analyze visual system activity from uh, Bob Rodek and Jonathan Stone. And here they, they, made, they programmed a computer to place spots of light at different distances from the receptive field or in the, within the receptive field of the cell. And they've shown open circles as on type responses and the size of the circle shows the magnitude of the response. So you can see here this very uh, beautiful diagram, again showing roughly circular, roughly concentric regions that show antagonistic or opposite type responses to uh, onset uh, of light, that is on type responses, or in this region here, we have the opposite type response. So when we say an on type ganglion cell, we really mean an on center type ganglion cell. It's on center, but it has an antagonistic off surround. Here's the same picture that I showed you in the previous slide. And this shows you Roddick and Stone's famous model, mathematical model, for the uh, receptive field. And they envisioned this as a combination of two processes. One is an excitatory process, shown schematically in red here, which has a very narrow spatial extent. You imagine looking on this line here, so in two dimensions. The second process is an inhibitory process, which is much more widely, uh, much spatially widespread, but it's much weaker. So in two dimensions, the two dimension or Gaussians sum to produce the receptive field. And although the receptive field surround is much weaker, nevertheless, it's much larger. And so their integrals are close to equal. Instead of stimulating the spots of light, we can take an approach pioneered by Christine and Montreal and John Robson. But, but you know, the very, the very similar uh, time in the 60s, where they, they varied the spatial frequency of a periodic stimulus. Remember, I showed you a periodic stimulus uh, to analyze cone photoreceptor responses. Well, you can use the same kind of stimulus to analyze the ganglion cell response. And there's a lot to think about in this slide. There's a lot to think about. Right, so this now we're showing the function of frequency. Remember that by Fourier's laws, frequency space and frequency are interchangeable. We get from one to the other by Fourier analysis. And here is our center response. So in frequency terms, both the center is a, high, is a low pass spatial filter. The surround is likewise a, high pa a low pass spatial filter but the surround is bigger, therefore it has a lower cutoff spatial frequency. And the sum, center plus surround, simple linear arithmetic sum, does a very good job of explaining the measured values that are shown at data points here. So this is mathematics meeting biology. Isn't that beautiful? I hope you like it. I go to bed at night and dream about this sort of thing. That's the kind of person I am. Okay, again, just to sort of sketch this out, think about this center is excitation. You'll see this sort of picture in textbooks uh, and surround is the inhibitory region. So the combination of the two gives you the center surround receptive field. So you'll see it drawn like this in textbooks, but you now know, of course, the surround, in fact, extends throughout this region. It's just that in the, set, in the middle of the receptive field, the center is so much stronger that the surround effects are negligible. And you can understand here why it is that uh, we see uh, band pass spatial tuning in the cell. Here at very low frequencies, both center and surround are activated. At intermediate frequencies, we have maximal activation of the center. And at very high spatial frequencies, beyond the resolution of the center itself, uh, we see the, the, the black and white bars sum within the center. So at very low frequencies and very high frequencies, the cell is poorly responsive, but at intermediate frequencies, the cell is more responsive. So you have a band pass 
Data of people. Now, what does all this mean? Well, if you think about it, you can understand that uniform changes in illumination will activate both the center and surround and largely be cancelled out by the inner retina, by the retinal uh, mechanisms that provide excitation and antagonistic inhibition to the cell. And that makes a lot of sense because contrast, not intensity, is what the visual system cares about. Here we see two identical uh, parts of an image, two, two uh, dark dots. Think about the edge here, the contrast, the intensity here is lower than the intensity here. Therefore, this is negative contrast. And now let's surround these identical dots with differing backgrounds. Oh, what's happened? Believe me, this is still the same intensity. This point has the same intensity as that point here. But now I've added you some more points, all identical intensity, but differing in contrast with the surround. In this case, the contrast is positive. Over here, with a bright surround, the contrast is negative. And as the contrast changes, the visibility difference uh, is decreased. It's not a very low contrast, or well, here it's zero contrast here. The object is invisible. Here it appears lighter, and here it appears darker than the surround. And this all makes sense if you think about the physical nature of uh, reflections in the real world. Uh, the black print on a white page has a much lower intensity, about 1 20th, in this example 1 20th, um, but in the uh, outdoors, in, in very high average intensity, the black print uh, still has 1 20th the absolute intensity, but the, the relative change is the same. It's one, sorry, 1 one twentieth relative intensity, but you can see here that the absolute value, the reflection from black print outside in the sunlight is higher than the white page on the indoors. So the visual system uh, has evolved to discount changes in average illumination and detect contrast change. And now I've sketched for you here. You're now you're starting to understand. Uh, you learned about spikes, and so now I can use this shorthand to um, express the responses of these cells to these different stimuli. So here's an on-center cell that responds a lot to high contrast, not so much to low contrast, and doesn't respond at all to negative contrast. And here's an off-center cell. It doesn't respond at all to positive contrast. But the greater the contrast, the greater the response of an off-center cell. So contrast increments and decrements are signaled uh, respectively by on-type and off-type neurons. Uh, here is an anatomical evidence for the presence of on and off mosaics. This is, uh, this is cat retina. And you can see, you can read this nice uh, review paper. I'll put this in the notes uh, by Heinz Wessler and Brian Boycott. And here they're showing you a method uh, whereby the on cells and the off cells can be selectively identified. I won't go into the details. But you can see here that if they're both these cell types, both the cells of a given type class are uh, labeled, then we see here a terrible mess. But if you selectively label just the on-center cells or the off-center cells, you can see that each type makes a tiling or mosaic of the retinal surface. And so this has two consequences. One is that the cells are arranged in a quasi-hexagonal array, and that each cell, each point on the retina will activate at least one on-cell and one offset. So this is the basis of parallel processing in the visual system. In this case, the parallel, the parallel nature is between on and off cells. And now I'm going to make increase the dimensionality of the system even further for you. And that's what we're, we're to do. That we're going to go from the retina into subcortical pathways. Now I'm not sure. Have, is it possible for you to ask for the for you to ask me questions today? I'm not getting any audio feedback from the hall. <laughs>
Thank you. I have a small question on the first part of the lecture. Um, that is, you said the photoreceptors go hyperpolarized when given an external light stimuli. Correct. Uh, so how does they give out glutamate? That's not a bit confusing for me. So when a cell is hyperpolarized, how is it releasing glutamate? Uh, oh, it's not. That's correct. It, that's correct. It, 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 the, the, the glutamate release is, is reduced by light and increased by decreases in local intensity. Okay? So photoreceptors are like off-type, well, they are off-type neurons. And then that signal, that off-type signal, gets re-inverted by the on-type bipolar cells. So it gets split into on and off channels. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I think so. Thank you, sir. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Any more? Uh, sir, you mentioned the value of membrane potential. So how is it related with the action potential? Here, as we can clearly see, the value is different. It's lesser than the normal action potentials. OK. Well, that's a, a common feature of um, excitable neurons. The ganglion cells are the neurons which express voltage-gated sodium channels in the soma and axon. And what that means is that every time the membrane potential uh, reaches a critical or threshold value, when the cell is depolarized past a critical point of minus 40 millivolts, then we activate the sodium channels and we have this almost explosive uh, reaction, a regenerative process whereby you have a rapid change in sodium uh, and potassium potential. I'm not sure if you've treated this uh, in, your, uh, in other lectures, the main basis of the uh, action potential, which is a feature of what's called excitable neurons, is, um, is very well treated in the textbooks. And I'm happy to uh, give you some summary of that process. If you send me an email, I'm happy to give you my, um, my uh, simple summary uh, of that process. But it's very well treated in textbooks. The way you can think of it is simply that you know, in terms of the retina, light goes in and action potentials come out. Action potentials are much faster. And unlike graded potentials, they can be transmitted all the way down the axon to reach all the way up into the brain. So ganglion cell axons, uh, in your eye, are nearly one centimetre long, more than a centimetre long. And so that signal can get to the other end un effectively unchanged. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I'll take, let's just take one more and then we'll move on, if there are more. Hi, I want to make sure if I understood it right, are the, uh, does the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells act as inhibitory cells? Do they act as inhibitory neurons? That's correct. They act as, in, by, in general, there mm -hmm. are, uh, it's biology, there are one or two exceptions, but by far the, the, the vast majority of uh, amacrine cells are inhibitory and all horizontal cells are inhibitory. Now, there's a, there are some, by the way mm -hmm. that the bipolar cells express their receptors, the on and off bipolar cells are both inhibited by GABA release from horizontal cells. That's a slightly complex uh, issue, but I'm glad to uh, give you some more details of that. Uh, as, uh, as, um, as you and your classmates remember, I'm a long way away in Australia, but even if we lose the next test match in Sydney, I nevertheless will be very happy to answer your questions, okay? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, okay. Oh, one last question, sir. What? Uh, uh, maybe if my question is out of scope or something, you can easily ignore it. So I don't want you to lose the match. See, what happens is when we see something and then close our eyes, we see an inverted, uh, whatever happens, if the dark turns into light and light turns into dark. I mean, if you see. Now, what I want to ask is, is there any information coming from the brain back to these photoreceptors and all that? Or it's just the magic of brain which happens? Or uh, what happens? Or is there any study on that? Or can you just, uh, I'm just oh, curious about that. Yes. 
Yes, you're asking about after images, and these are generated right at the very first uh, stage of vision. The after image signal is already present in the cone. If you, if you illuminate a cone for a long time, then it becomes progressively more difficult uh, to activate afterwards. And a ganglion cell responds to the offset of a prolonged on stimulus as if it was an off stimulus. So those, um, those processes already take place uh, within the retina. So what you see, the after image you see, is because the uh, ganglion cells uh, have been activated in, in, uh, in the opposite way to they would um, normally. So, that, so the activation is sensed as the same, uh, as the same signal or uh, uh, the same intensity by the brain. A very fascinating topic. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, thank I you. wanted to okay. ask uh, one more question. I wanted to ask, like, what is the difference between on and off bipolar cells? Like, is it like the metabotropic and inotropic expression on their uh, membrane? Like, what makes bipolar on bi and another bipolar off? Uh, you, they, you've answered the question exactly. You've been reading. Very good. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes, yes. The on center cells, bipolar cells, express metabotropic glutamate receptors. Hmm. And these don't work, these don't open directly to change ion currents, but there's a, so, there a second messenger system. So they don't express and at the all like the... Uh, cells express glutamate receptors, yes? So they don't express at all like the inotropic receptor, the off-center, at all? Or like they are more prominent? Yes, look, it, 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 there, there are different families of uh, uh, off-type of, uh, uh, of ionotropic receptors. Different bipolar cells express different makeup of uh, these receptors. There seems to be only one type of metabotropic re uh, glutamate receptor, but all on bipolar cells seem to express that. But largely, by and large, in general, yes, the, the, you've got it right that the off-center cells, off-type off bipolar cells express ionotropic receptors, on-type bipolar cells express metabotropic uh, okay. receptors. Uh, so that's more, the molecular what? key to splitting the on and off signals. Uh, one more question. Uh, in, in vivo condition, like photoreceptors are not uh, generating action potentials, right? They are generating graded potentials in vivo Correct. condition. So in vitro, like, uh, can we expect a photoreceptor to uh, generate action potentials? No, the, those receptors aren't expressing uh, voltage sensitive, sensitive sodium channels. Okay. So you now in vivo, in vitro, you, you, you're going to have to work. If you want to make a new if you want to stimulate the photoreceptors and uh, stimulate the bipolar cells, you have greater changes in potential. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you so much. So, okay, look, I think we better move on now. And I, I, I hope if we finish, I think we've got a bit of time at the end. I'm planning to finish uh, in a, a little over half an hour. But I think, I hope we'll have a bit of time at the end for additional questions. Let's go and uh, now and talk about subcortical pathways. So now we're leaving the retina. We're going to take a trip uh, up the optic nerve and we're going to look at ha what happens at the place where the eye plugs into the brain, okay? So here's the textbook figure. Here's the eye. Uh, here's the optic nerve. Uh, you, you may have learned about the, part, about the, the decussation uh, in the uh, optic chiasm where the left half of the visual world is transmitted to the right half of the brain and the right half of the visual world is transmitted to the left half of the brain. Uh, let's spend a bit of time, we're going to spend a bit of time looking at this little place here. It's about the size uh, of a pea inside your brain, um, but all of the visual signals, nearly all the visual signals for conscious visual perception pass through this, uh, uh, this nucleus called the lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, and they form these fibers coming out of the lateral geniculate form the optic radiations and they project to the mostly to the primary visual cortex back here in the back of the brain. So here's a um, simplified diagram of the primate visual system. Primates have high acuity vision. Uh, I've just ignored all the fancy stuff you just learned about and just pretend I'm just showing you distribution of ganglion cells in the retina. And you can see that nearly all of the ganglion cells are piled up close to the optic axis. So when you look at an object, it's um, it's, uh, it, the image of that object falls on the optic axis and on the fovea here. And you think very simplistically about the, post, the transmission of these fibers into the brain, about a million fibers in each of your optic nerves 
Uh, and here is this layered structure called the lateral geniculate nucleus. Again, so shown very simplified here, very simplified. It has two, there are two main uh, divisions of this nucleus, one called small cell division and one, called, and one large cell division. And so we're going to look at, at that um, process in a bit more detail now. But first of all, I'm going to make an important point for you. You think about this, when you uh, uh, observe an object, the central most one degree of visual angle, so you imagine there's about 180 degrees of visual angle here, all the way around is 360, so there's about 180 uh, degrees of visual field. The central one degree of visual field contains nearly, is serviced by nearly half the ganglion cells in your eye. And so if you think about that central degree here, one degree in radius, then that one degree occupies nearly 90% of the cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus. So it's a, we call that a, a magnification, okay? The, the, the topography of the retina is preserved. Neighboring cells here get their input from neighboring parts of visual space. But this topography is a, this, this map, so there is like a map, but it is a distorted map. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't faithfully represent the retina uh, visual field. It rather represents the neural visual, the neural uh, visual field. So this slide now shows you, uh, this is a, a vertical section through mon monkey retina. So now the receptors are out here. Uh, he these receptors connected by polar cells down here in this, in this layer, and they connect to ganglion cells in the ganglion cell layer, and these cells, these are the axons uh, going out to the optic nerve. So in the fovea, there is a distortion, an anatomical distortion of the retina layers. So the bipolar cells and ganglion cells, amacrine cells, they're all swept away from the center of the fovea, but <clears throat> nevertheless, the functional connectivity is preserved. So this ganglion cell gets input from this bipolar cell here, located much closer to the phobia. And here I'm showing you the two main classes of ganglion cells in, um, in your retina. One class is called midget cells. These, have, these cells have small cell bodies, small dendritic fields. We're looking in whole mount view here. And the second class is called parasol cells. And the man who first described them called Stefan Poliak, um, he uh, thought these cells look like the, look like an open, uh, the, the dendritic field look like an open parasol. And these cells, he called midget cells because they were so very, very small. So near to the fovea here, at, um, within one millimeter of the fovea, these cells are very, very tiny dendritic field. As we move away from the fovea, from increasing difference, distances, we see uh, increasing uh, dendritic field size and the corresponding increasing receptive field size of, of the midget cells. Likewise, it is very uh, close to the fovea. Parasol cells have small uh, dendritic fields. As we move away from the fovea, the, the dendritic field and receptive field grows larger. But at a given position, at a given location, distance from the fovea, the midget cells are always smaller than the parasol cells. So again, here you see this multiplication of uh, signals being sent to the eye. There are on-type midget cells and off-type midget cells, on-type parasol cells and off-type parasol cells. Each of these four mosaics now completely tiles the retina. So each point in the visual field is covered by one an on-midget, an off-midget, an on-parasol and an off-parasol cell. So here we've expanded our concept of parallel processing uh, in the visual system. These different cells, we're going to now look at the different functional properties of the midget cells and the parasol cells. Here I'm showing you the different layers uh, of the inner semi-thin section through the lateral geniculate nucleus. So here's a cutaway section from monkey brain. Uh, and you can see here this structure has in, in monkeys, in, um, in, in humans, and in old world monkeys near to the fovea, we have four parvocellular layers and two magnocellular layers, shown more deeply, dark, uh, shown deeper here. 
This again, you can see this layered structure here. This is a slightly different histological technique. Here, the cell body layers appear slightly lighter uh, than the surrounding neuropil, slightly darker here. Again, you can see two megacellular layers, one, two, three, four parvocellular layers. And each layer gets input from one eye. This one here gets input from the ip, and it's arranged a bit like a, uh, a beautiful layered cake. So the, 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 the alternate eyes, the contralateral and ipsilateral eyes, innovate alternating uh, sequential layers uh, in the lateral geniculate body. Let's look now at the different, uh, let's look now, let's think about again, about, as I told you, the process or the, the, the basis of um, high visual acuity. So here, if I ask you to fixate your eye, to put your eye onto this red dot here and keep it there. Now you should, if you're looking, keeping your eye fixed in that position, you should be able to read the letters, I hope, surround, immediately surrounding. But if I ask you to read this letter here, out here, further out in your visual field, you will move your eye so that that letter there is, uh, the image of that letter falls uh, on your fovea. So now return your eyes to this position here, please. Fixate, I'm asking you to fixate on this point here. And now what I'll do is I'll restore the readability by increasing the size of the letters in your peripheral visual field. And now I hope that even outside the, your fovea, even though your eye is pointing here, you should be able to read most of those letters. I hope that's correct. So I'm showing you there's nothing wrong with your peripheral vision. It's just that the spatial scale, the spatial resolution uh, decreases in, in the periphery. And the highest, sorry, the highest resolution is, as you might expect, it part, uh, served by the midget cell system. So high resolution, high spatial acuity um, is uh, highest in the phobia and it's highest in the midget system in the phobia. And the midget cells are the cells that project to the parvocellular layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus. I know it's annoying. Midget starts with M and parvocellular starts with P. It's highly annoying, but you better get used to it because that's the way it is. Okay, that's the, 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 the terminology, that's just the terminology. Okay, the midget system projects the parvo layers has high visual acuity. What about the parasol system? Parasol cells and cells in the magnocellular layers, parasol cells project the magnocellular layers, they have much lower visual acuity, but they're very sensitive to movement. So I hope my little demonstration will work now. My little Australian demonstration will work for you. Uh, if what you, ah. I hope you saw an Australian animal moving across the screen. Yes. So these kinds of images, movement in the visual scene is, do you want to see this? Can, would you like to see it again? It's very nice, isn't it? If it was India, I'd show you a tiger. So the human visual system is, uh, is, is very sensitive to moving, to, to movement, and we can even use movement to extract uh, the form of an object. And we don't know for certain yet, but there's lots of very good scientific evidence that these kinds of images, that the movement, form from movement, is processed by the magnocellular system. So now that's easy for you. You can think of magno cells, magno for movement. That gives you a clue. And so what we can do is we can measure, just like we can measure receptive fields in the retina, we can measure the receptive fields way up here in the lateral geniculate nucleus, right? Remember, each point in the eye is, that, is imaging a certain point in visual space. We can move an object into the receptive field of this gang of a ganglion cell. This ganglion cell projects to a lateral geniculate nucleus cell. And because of the chain of synaptic connections, starting with photoreceptors, all the way up here into the brain, we can, we can measure a receptive field out here in the world from way up here uh, in the brain. And this is um, what I've been spending the last 
uh, 40 years of my life doing. I hope you don't think I'm, such, I'm a terribly boring person because I do that. In any event, let's look now at the receptive field uh, of a cell uh, in the LGN. So here's our schematic, uh, here's a schematic of our setup, an anesthetized animal. We've got an electrode very close to uh, a single cell in the lateral geniculate body. I explained the basis of extracellular recording to you, so I don't need to explain that again. And we have a stimulus out there in the real world. First of all, I'll show you an historic video uh, from uh, David Hubel and Torsten Weasel. Uh, this is part of the work that earned them uh, the Nobel Prize in, in the 70s, Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology in the 70s. And it shows, it's a video showing uh, the stimulus that an anaesthet that was placed before in the visual field of an anaesthetized cat, and they're recording the activity of a single cell in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And the most important thing you'll hear here is a sort of a crackling sound, and the crackling sound, each uh, crackle or it sounds like a raindrop falling on a roof, is a single action potential. They last for two milliseconds, so in the laboratory, we listen to them through a loudspeaker because it's, the, the ear is attuned to high temporal frequency. Okay, is everybody ready? Let's see if the video works. So far, so good. Oh, marvellous. I hope you enjoyed that. Did it work? Yes? Okay, good. So you saw there a very nice piece of science. Okay, the Hublin weasel systematically changed the size of the stimulus. And I hope that you saw that large objects, a, broad, a, a diffuse stimulus, was less effective than a small stimulus. That is a stimulus which filled the centre of the receptive field, but was no larger. I hope you also noticed science at work. Hubel and Weasel systematically tested different orientations of a bar stimulus. And we saw approximately the same response for different orientations of the bar. In other words, the receptive field is roughly circular. So again, and so now I'll show you an example from our own laboratory where we're just testing a single orientation. And uh, we'll see that for a periodic stimulus, likewise, for every time um, the bar goes past, the center of the receptive field, <clears throat> we see a burst of action potential. So here we can build up what we call a peri-stimulus time histogram. That is an average response as a function of time of this cell for a periodic visual stimulus. And we can use this and now we can we can analyze this to analyze the, um, the, freak, the transfer characteristics uh, of this cell. So we can analyze it rather as we would analyze uh, an a component in an electrical circuit. But it's not an electrical circuit in the brain. The brain is not an electrical circuit. The brain is not a computer chip. The brain is biology. You can see I'm getting excited here, aren't I? Okay. You have to think, you have to keep biology and evolution in mind when you're thinking about computing in the brain. Okay, let's use this method now to analyze the contrast sensitivity of uh, some individual neurons. <clears throat> uh, we can express the uh, contrast of a stimulus as the difference between the maximum and minimum divided by their sum. So if this was 12%, uh, then the difference between the dark bar and light bar here would be 12% uh, of, uh, of their sum. So here, low contrast, 3%, close to your limit of contrast sensitivity. You, cannot, you can barely distinguish the light and dark regions from a gray, uniform and uniform gray, uniform gray background. Here, at very high contrast, the stimulus is easily distinguishable from the gray background. 
And you can see here the responses of a single cell. I haven't marked it on this, um, on this cell, but I want you to guess now if this might, would be a magnocellular cell or a parvocellular cell. I'll just give you a moment to think about that. What, which cell type do you think, a cell with a higher, bigger receptive field, would that have a higher or a lower contrast sensitivity than a cell with a small receptive field? Okay, I can't see your hands, but who says, put up your hand if you think a large receptive field would have higher contrast sensitivity than a small receptive field? And who thinks a small receptive field would have higher contrast sensitivity? Well, if you thought along the lines, well, if it's got a bigger receptive field, then it should be able to catch a larger area and it should be able to catch more neurotransmitter from that larger area. So perhaps the contrast sensitivity would be higher. And indeed that is the case. The big receptive field gets convergent input from more cones. So if, if photons were water, then if you wanted to catch more of them and catch more change, then you'd use a bigger bucket. So the bucket is bigger in the case of a large cell and the contrast sensitivity is higher. And so my guess here is between 50 and 100% contrast we see little change in the uh, response of this cell. We see a, a response to 3%, increasing to 12%, high at 50%, not much higher at 100%. So I reckon this is gonna be a magnocellular cell and uh, that's what we're gonna look at in the next slide. This shows you now a summary of contrast on the x-axis, input, and the amplitude of response of two cell, cell types this, in this case, this is a marmoset lateral geniculate nucleus. Uh, and here are the averages of uh, a couple of dozen cells, I recall. And you can see here that as a function of contrast, the response of uh, parvo cells <coughs> is relatively linear, but the response of magno cells uh, starts to saturate after about 30 or 40% contrast. So these cells are much more sensitive to contrast but their response saturates at high contrast. If you wanted to tell the difference between 50% between and 100% contrast, the magno cells wouldn't be much use to you, but parvo cells would because they would respond differentially. If you were the brain, you could distinguish 50% from 100% using parvo cells, but not using magno cells. Likewise, if you were the brain, you would be able to detect very low contrast using magno cells uh, but not using parvo cells because they show very little response. So, so that's how the way that we interpret uh, neural responses. Uh, and you can think about the function of contrast sensitivity by this example here. Um, if a very, as a, in a typical scene like this on a foggy day, uh, the contrast of these trees is decreasing with the increasing uh, amount of water vapor between the eye or the camera lens in this case uh, and the um, uh, and the uh, and the target, which is a tree, which are, are trees here. You can see they appear to fade as if to grey. That is, their contrast of this of their, their contrast is growing lower. So at the limit of contrast, the contrast sensitivity for high contrast sensitivity, we need this to be able to judge or to, to distinguish low contrast objects. So, for example, this uh, car here, you might even be able to make out another car sitting here. That's close to your contrast threshold. And so we almost certainly use magno cells for detecting low contrast stimuli. <clears throat> this shows you a second aspect uh, of the distinction of magno cells from parvo cells. Now this, these uh, records are not from uh, monkey retina, they're from cat retina. They show the equivalent. This is a so-called X-type cell. And like X cells and parvo cells, they both show relatively tonic responses to maintained contrast. So the stimulus is on here for five seconds and the response is maintained. Magno cells, and in this case Y cells in cat retina, uh, in addition to showing high contrast sensitivity, they show very phasic responses. So the response decreases or adapts rapidly uh, as a function of time after stimulus onset. <clears throat> so the contrast sensitivity of these two cell systems is distinct uh, and the temporal response properties of these two cell systems are distinct. <clears throat> 
And it makes sense if I, as you recall, that little picture of the kangaroo, that um, a high contrast sensitivity uh, and motion and high motion sensitivity uh, go and rapidly uh, adapting responses, very phasic responses, they all go hand in hand. Now let's think about spatial frequency tuning. <clears throat> like uh, just as in um, for temporal, uh, for contrast tuning, we can change the spatial frequency uh, of a simple stimulus. And we can see here that at low contrast, the center and the surround cancel out. At intermediate contrast, we have an optimum, uh, sorry, at intermediate spatial frequencies, uh, we have some uh, optimum where the center is maximally stimulated and at very high spatial frequencies, we have a much uh, weaker response uh, where the, um, <clears throat> where even within the center, the, the uh, positive and negative contrasts uh, cancel out. So we can map out a spatial tuning function for magnet cells and for parvo cells. And before we do that, what I'll show you here on a single uh, image is your own contrast sensitivity spatial transfer function. By transfer, I mean what goes in is transferred to what comes out. And in this case, what comes out is your visual perception. So here, the x-axis of this image is increasing spatial frequency and the y-axis is decreasing contrast. And I hope that for you, most uh, viewers, depending on the distance from the screen, the screen of course, you'll see a, a sort of an inverted U-shaped function where the bars here, the visibility decreases around about this point for me, and the visibility is higher at low, at low contrast, the threshold is lower uh, up here uh, at intermediate spatial frequencies, and then the threshold increases again at, uh, at, much, at uh, very low spatial frequencies. So that's your spatial frequency tuning uh, function. Let's have a look now at spatial frequency tuning functions of magnet cells and parvo cells. So by analyzing uh, the cell, uh, groups of cells, we see um, here, here in, in summary, is a difference in spatial frequency tuning between magnet cells and parvo cells. Parvo cellular cells have uh, very small receptive fields, therefore they can respond to relatively high spatial frequencies. In fact, an individual cell can respond to the highest spatial frequency that's visible to your eye. Uh, that frequency is approximately 60 cycles. see here their frequency, their sensitivity is higher than that of magnet cells. So in other words, magnet cells don't respond to 30 cycles per degree. So how can the brain know about 30 cycles per degree if it only has magnet cells? It's a combination of the two that gives us the overall spatial frequency tuning function of human vision. At the limit of, uh, at the spatial frequency tuning limit, you see here, here is the array of cone photoreceptors. And here you see superimposed a grating at the spatial frequency limit, at the uh, limit, at the high frequency limit of human vision. And you see here that the frequency limit is close to what's called the Nyquist limit, the theoretical limit uh, of the cone receptor array. You see here, the difference between one light bar here at the beginning of the next light bar, in other words, one cycle from white, uh, from yellow to black and back again, there are one, two rows of receptors. 
So as long if two receptors, uh, so this receptor can, this array can distinguish between this light bar here and uh, the uh, dark uh, part of the stimulus here, because different receptors are activated. For higher frequencies, the same receptors will be activated uh, by each bar. So that's the spatial frequency tuning. That's the spatial frequency limit of human vision, which is very high or very acute. At high uh, uh, acuity limit, at the limit, we can transmit. The brain can trans can differentiate signals uh, from uh, at the limit that the receptor array array can provide, and that's because each receptor in the fovea is hooked up to one to at least one uh, midget ganglion cell. <clears throat> okay, so we've treated now um, the basics. I've introduced you to the concept of parallel processing in the visual system. I've shown you. cells passing through the parvo layers of the LGN and these cells make the on and off midget cells make up altogether about 80% of the ganglion cells in your eye. The parvo cells make up about 10% and now what I've drawn for you here so here schematically you've learned about on and uh, on and off type cells divisions in the in the retina and what I'm showing you here is the is a, a brief glimpse into the remaining cell types uh, in the in your eye, so all of these cells here, these other there's a, a wide variety of cells. We don't have, we're not going to discuss them today, but some of them have very interesting properties. Hardly anything is known about them yet. This is science, not engineering. We have to try and to figure out how the brain works. We don't design it and then build it and then provide an instruction manual. There's no instruction manual for the brain. Maybe it would be nice if there was. In any event, these cells make up only 10% of all of the cells in your eye. But nevertheless, in absolute numbers, the number of these cells is close to the number of total number of cells in the retina of a cat. So it's these, the, your eye has, is specialized for very high visual acuity. But if you think about a cat being able to chase uh, and catch and devour a, mo a mouse with amazing precision, then a low, these low acuity cells could nevertheless be doing a lot, uh, be doing many visual functions uh, that we still don't really uh, understand very well. <clears throat> so I won't go into detail about these cells, but you need to remember that they're out there. If you were an engineer, you might design a system just by having you know, one set of cells, one midget cells, or, or one set of parasol cells, or maybe some combination of the two. Uh, but the, the way evolution has given us a wide variety of ganglion cells. And we're just starting now to understand, to understand their properties. Okay, so that's the end of the second part uh, of uh, the lecture. So why don't we take, uh, take some questions, uh, and then we'll move on. I'll give you an introduction to color vision. Hi, I have uh, one question. Uh, uh, so we saw the uh, patterns, right? Uh, so how are, how are the cones and rods and uh, the neurons actually becoming sensitive uh, to those patterns, uh, like uh, uh, the straight lines or circles or anything like that? 
Uh, you, <clears throat> okay, so what you'll learn when Professor Jonathan Victor uh, gives you a lecture, I think tomorrow, uh, he's going to say, what I'm providing you now is the bricks and mortar, is the input to the to cortical processing. And what he will show you is how cells in the primary visual cortex, the next stage of processing, they begin to extract the pattern. They begin to extract pattern. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So cells in the primary visual cortex become sensitive to edges, and you'll learn more about that and that process uh, as we proceed. So that, 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 that's a very, very good question, that the, the uh, analysis of uh, orientation in the visual field, it almost certainly begins mostly in the primary visual cortex. There's a little bit happens in the LGN, but not much. You saw the receptive fields. You saw Hubel and Weiser's experiment that, you know, we change the orientation of the line and the cell response is very similar. In other words, they're, they're roughly, um, roughly circular. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions? I'm just going to have a little drink while we're waiting. I can hear you, don't worry. No more questions? Uh, Don't be shy. Uh, yes, sir, uh, why there is uh, distortion of the fovea? If, if it is plain, what will happen? I mean, why there is um, distortion of the fovea? The fovea. Why is it? Yeah. Oh, wh why is there distortion of the fovea? <clears throat> well, the, the best explanation, if you think, I've shown you you know, quite colourful images of the, the retina. In fact, the retina, the retinal cells are almost transparent, but they are only almost transparent. They are not completely transparent, obviously, the photoreceptors can't be completely transparent or they would not absorb light. And the other, the other cells in the retina are almost transparent, but they do absorb a little bit of light. In other words, in the, and at the cell membrane, the light will be um, refracted. So in other words, the, mem the retina, rem remember, the light passes through all the retinal layers before it hits the photoreceptors. But in the fovea, all the other layers are moved aside so as to minimize the blurring of the image coming in to the receptor layer. So the receptors can get a uh, more high resolution image, an image that's not blurred by the retina itself. Now, there are other reasons for the for that distortion at the fovea, but that is almost certainly the main reason. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So. Can, can it be cured if, if there is uh, any uh, issues with the uh, distortion, like uh, the, the concentration of concentration of light falls on it? So if, if there is some problem, then can it be cured? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't quite catch the I didn't quite catch the question. There was some audio problem. Do you mind to ask your question uh, again? If there is any issue, can it be cured? Uh, 
Can it be corrected? I mean. And what are we trying to cure here? I'm sorry. Uh, the distortion field, if it is not proper, then then the, the vision will be blurry, like you told. I see, I see. Is there, uh, yes, of course. If the receptor layer, for example, is damaged, uh, some of you may have elderly relatives who are suffering from uh, macular degeneration. Yeah. This, the, and uh, if the receptor layer is damaged, then that part of the visual field becomes blind. That's correct. But of course, you can have, at the moment, we do not know how to, uh, how to restore uh, receptors, uh, uh, restore cone photoreceptors. There are some initial trials to restoring function in rod photoreceptors in some retina diseases. So medically, it can be uh, receptor, receptor disease can be to some extent. We hope that within probably fifteen to twenty years, we should be able to cure receptor diseases. No. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Maybe take just one more question. I'm just going to have another little drink, but um, don't worry, I can hear you. Okay, how do we differentiate between blobs and stripes uh, in artificial vision and uh, natural vision? Blobs and uh, stripes. No, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, I didn't catch the question again. Do you mind to, re to try yeah, again? Uh, uh, how do we distinguish between blobs, blobs and stripes? In artificial vision to like uh, robotic vision, uh, uh, in comparison to art, uh, natural vision. Uh, you mean you, you, by stripes? You mean uh, orientation? Yeah, orientation orient sensitivity. Yes, and yes. Uh, as yes. a circular uh, object, something like when we try to distinguish natural objects to uh, artificial objects. Oh, how do we distinguish natural objects from artificial objects? That's a very good question. That's an extremely good question. Um, and I think the, the, the most simple answer to that is that the, 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 well, the, the most important aspect of, um, uh, of natural as well as artificial vision, a very important as aspect is edge extraction. So in the case of natural vision, as you'll learn from Professor Victor, individual neurons become sensitive to the orientation of objects in the visual world. So for every cell in the LGN that has a round receptive field, there are about 100 cells in the cortex, each of which has a receptive field at the same position that's sensitive to different orientation of edges in the world. Now, Natural scenes, of course, have edges as well. They're a lot more complex than, um, than you know, very artificial situations, as, as the examples that I showed you. Uh, but the same principles seem to apply. Does that answer your question? Partly. Hi. Uh, so you had mentioned that most of the processing for instance, pattern recognition will happen in the visual cortex. So what all kind of uh, filtering or pre-processing happens at the retina or, you know, as it move up, moves up the optic nerve before the LGN? Uh, yeah, okay, that's a very good question. Well, the, the main process in the, in the retina, you can think about it as being one of the most important things the retina does is it... Um, is it, it, it adjusts like an automatic exposure adjustment in a camera. It gets rid of the, it discounts the background illumination. Now, obviously you can 
tell whether it's nighttime or daytime, but if you think about the absolute changes in intensity between where you are sitting in the uh, in the uh, in the in your meeting room there, the absolute change there between that inside the meeting room and the average intensity outside on the street is probably four or five log units, so many thousand fold difference. But you can recognize objects just as well inside, the same object inside or outside, because you're sensitive to contrast. The contrast doesn't, of objects does not change, it's the absolute intensity that changes. So the retina, its main job is to throw away the absolute intensity. And its second job is to, its second job is to split up the signal, the incoming contrast changes into positive changes and negative. Uh, and the third is to start this process of uh, to, to split the signal into high and low spatial frequency and uh, phasic and tonic components by different ganglion cell types. So they're, they're the main jobs of the retina. Now there are other, I showed you those other strange and exotic cell types, and they might be doing more complex uh, image processing. It's a very interesting topic in its own right, but the main uh, job is to, of the retina is to get rid of the background. The main job of the visual cortex is to extract the edges. Now, that's a very simple, obviously a very simplistic view. We know the cortex is connected to the LGN. Uh, the LGN is connected to the cortex. Every part of the brain uh, is connected to many other parts of the brain. So I've given you uh, an explanation so far that acts, that pretends the process is serial. Well, from the retina to the brain, we know that is a one-way street, okay? There is no connection back from the brain to the retina, not in, not in primates. In some fishes and birds there is, but not in, not in primates. So I hope that goes some way to answering your question. Yeah, that was a good explanation. Okay, we're back online now. So now I'm going to introduce you to uh, biological uh, color vision in the next um, half, uh, half hour. Okay, you see, you've noticed that I've been emphasizing differences between biology and engineering. I don't think engineering is better than biology. I don't think biology is better than engineering, but they are different. And it's a very bad mistake for you to imagine that the brain is a computer chip any more than I would like to imagine that a computer chip is a brain, has a brain of its own. So when we think about biology and we think about the way the brain functions, we think about it in terms of the affordances or uses that the, the, the environment can provide to the visual system. So let's have a look at some uh, a scene. It's rendered here in grayscale. So there are no, <clears throat> there are no color differences. Uh, and you can see you recognize instantly this is, it's only a drawing, but you would say, well, there's there are two trees in this scene. So now let's add a chromatic signal to that image. Well, now we can quite quickly see that this uh, tree here would be a more attractive, might be a more attractive object if you were looking for fruit than this tree over here. We can see even, uh, even though acuity is good, you can make out the individual leaves on this tree. You can quite quickly spot that there's nothing interesting on that tree from the point of view of fruit. So here there are obviously lots of different attractive fruits on this rather unlikely tree. And we can discriminate the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the fruit from the foliage of the tree by virtue of it, not only its shape, but also of its spectral reflectance. So nearly all animals, nearly all animals, all animals with eyes, nearly all animals with eyes have multiple spectral receptor types, more than one receptor type and nearly all animals with eyes are capable of 
extracting some information about the spectral uh, reflectances in their environment. <clears throat> and color vision is an important form of tele-reception. Vision is the most important form of tele-reception in general. Because we have eyes, we can interact with this object here, even though we are not touching it. <coughs> we can interact with this object, although we are not touching it. The higher our acuity is, the further away we can interact with objects without touching them, and therefore increasing our uh, ecological uh, uh, behavioural range. So colour vision is very important uh, for identifying objects. <clears throat> uh, here's another use of colour vision. And that's what, we, as we call it, we use it as a, a, a linking feature of vision. So if you, <coughs> if you had lost your bicycle and thought perhaps it's been taken to the bicycle repair shop or just simply to the, to the disposal area here and you want to recover it, well, you might be able to see if you knew it was, a, if it was an orange bicycle, say, I remember that bike, it was orange. You could see a little bit of it here, a little bit of it here, and by, by, because of the same color, you could put those points together to identify the form of your bicycle. So you can use color to link different parts of the visual scene. In other words, to help you to segregate or, uh, or pass the visual scene uh, into meaningful objects. If I drain away the color from this image, you see it becomes much more difficult even, even more difficult to distinguish um, the individual uh, or to try to put together uh, or interpret the individual uh, bicycles in this scene. <laughs> so let's think about it. What is this process? <coughs> um, Isaac Newton recognized that um, light can be decomposed into, um, uh, into a colored spectrum. Isaac Newton also recognized that um, objects in themselves don't have any color. It's interaction between the photons of light bouncing off the objects and the visual system that allows the sense of color. He recognized that color was a, a percept, a perception. And Thomas Young um, recognized or first suggested that the retina has not a multitude of receptors for combing out the visual spectrum, but rather that the number uh, must be limited. So let's take a simple example here. <clears throat> uh, we know, let's say, let's take as a function of wavelength, different objects reflect different uh, parts of the visual spectrum. Things that look red to us, they reflect strongly in the long wavelength part of the, of the spectrum. Things that appear green to uh, most humans, uh, reflect more strongly in the medium wave part of the spectrum. But these, these reflectances are more or less continuous. If you imagine a single receptor system, which as a function of wavelength has some peak sensitivity, then the receptor effectively integrates over its receptive range, the spectral reflectance of objects in the real world. So imagine multiplying or convolving this sensitivity here uh, with this uh, reflectance spectrum and the single receptor sends a single message to the brain. We can represent it by the height of this bar here. Now you can imagine two objects which appear different colors on the basis of a single receptor type. If the, re if the um, integral with the area under the curve uh, and, and the, uh, of the, uh, the convolution of the spectrum of the photon catch is the same, <clears throat> then the same message will be sent to the brain. So the single receptor system is colorblind. It only knows that so it can only tell the brain that something's happened uh, within this wavelength range. So Thomas Young's brilliant suggestion uh, was that the eye contains um, a limited number of receptors, and I've shown you here. Uh, the receptors in your eye are sensitive to, there are three types, sensitive to short, medium, and long wave light. Each receptor sends a single simple message to the brain, which we represent here as the height of these uh, bars. Uh, and 
somewhere kind of in the brain. It's a percept. It's a percept based on the relative activation of receptors. <coughs> So now you can understand, and that bit of understanding helps you understand the principle of color reproduction. So as you know, of course, you're not looking at real apples on real trees when you see this image uh, on a video monitor projected onto your screen. So let's think about a real apple and a real tree. So it reflects strongly in the long wave part of the visible spectrum. Uh, it's caught, the, the, the photon catch across uh, of the apple is uh, caught by these three receptor types. This receptor is more sensitive, the long wave receptor is more, catches more photons, therefore sends a stronger message to the brain, uh, therefore the object appears red. Now, <clears throat> the television monitor, of course, is composed of tiny uh, pixels, pixel, element, pixel elements, each having uh, a certain uh, either a red, a blue, green, or red phosphor, to ex uh, which excites it. And they're, they're so small that they can't be distinguished individually. Now, here's the physical uh, spectral emission of those three phosphors. Even though the physical nature of this distribution is completely different to that of a real apple and a real tree, yet if the receptor activation caused by these two physically different stimuli is identical, then the perceived color will be identical. So in other words, identical cone activation produces indistinguishable colors and indistingu indistinguishable colors, despite having a physically quite distinct um, <coughs> characteristic are called metamers. <coughs> So color obeys, it doesn't obey physical laws, it obeys psychophysical laws. Now, most um, mammals uh, have uh, only uh, three main opsin types in their retina. One with short wave opsin and one with medium or long wave opsin, rather close to what we call the green opsins. So most mammals have um, only two cone photoreceptor types. Uh, primates, including humans, uh, and uh, about 100 species of apes and monkeys, um, show three uh, receptor types, the short wave, op short wave receptor, medium wave receptor, and long wave receptor. <clears throat> Notice that I do not call them, we're allowed to call them, between us, between you and me, you're allowed to call them blue, green, and red. But obviously, as I've just explained to you, the receptors themselves are colorblind. They don't know anything about color. Uh, now, before we go on, I'll show you how we can analyze color in color signals in the brain. So here's our stimulus. We've seen this a couple of times already. We've got something happening in the outside world, usually a drifting grating or, so, or something like that. It gets picked up by the uh, receptors, transmitted to a ganglion cell, goes through. Here's the LGN. We're recording a receptive field. Now, remember, as I told you, we can predict exactly, we can produce metamers using um, display technology because we know very precisely the sensitivity of the receptors. Therefore, we know very precisely what intensities of uh, what a receptor, what activation a certain set of blue, green, and red intensities will produce. But we can drive this logic in reverse. We can also say, well, what if we start with a desired set of cone activations and calculate the spectral distribution that we need to produce that activation? Okay, it's just to remember it's a convolution of this uh, distribution here with these three distributions here. So we can say let's just change, have, let's produce two lights which keep constant activation in medium and long receptors and only change the activation in the short wave receptors. Pretty tricky, eh? And now the next step is simply to color our grating. So instead of having light bars and dark bars, the difference between these bars here 
these lime bars and the lilac bars is only seen by the shortwave receptors. Therefore, if we record from a neuron that responds to this stimulus, we can uh, safely uh, assume that this uh, neuron gets input from shortwave sensitive cones. Perhaps the others as well, but definitely the shortwave cones. I hope everybody's understood Uncle Paul's simple diagram explaining this principle, which is called silent substitution. Now we can use this method uh, combined with uh, modern techniques in ophthalmology to identify the cone photoreceptor array in the living human eye. Now here again, the medium, long and shortwave cones uh, have been painted artificially in color, but this, <clears throat> this shows you what the mosaic looks like in your eye. And it's very similar to the mosaic uh, in a monkey's eye. The, co the blue cones make up about 10% of receptors so you can see here, they're, they're in a quasi-hexagonal array. They're, very, they're always very well separated from each other. And the rest of the cones, the M and L cones, make up the vast majority, and they're arranged more or less uh, randomly. Very hard to distinguish from a random, a random array. So here, uh, you know, less than 200 years after the first suggestion, after the trichromatic theory, uh, we can see the actual array in the living human eye, marvelous triumph of, um, uh, of science. Oops. Okay, so let me just show you some examples now of uh, recordings and identifying cone signals <coughs> uh, in, uh, in the lateral geniculate nucleus. So here I'm showing you, here are the layers. Uh, this is a marmoset lateral geniculate nucleus. Here are the layers of the LGN. These cells, these animals only have two parvocellular layers, PC. Uh, they have two megacellular layers, MC. Uh, and uh, remember, I told you these cell layers get input from uh, midget cells. These layers get input from pa parasol cells. Uh, in addition, uh, there is another set of layers called coniocellular, a third parallel set uh, visual pathway through the LGN. I haven't discussed this so far. It's only about 10% of the cells, but it turns out that some of them are very interesting. So let's go through, let's pass our electrodes through the parvo layers. We encountered this cell here. It's a parvocellular cell. <clears throat> it responds vigorously to brightness changes. But if we color our grating uh, to, to activate only the short wave cones, then we see little, hardly any response from the cell. And the logic here is this cell does not get functional input from short wave cones. Now we are electrode passes, next our electrode passes into the coniocellular layers. And we find that about 20 or 30% of the cells in these layers do get strong functional input from shortwave cones. You see the cell doesn't care very much for um, brightness change, but when the, when the shortwave cones are, uh, are activated, we see a massive increase in response uh, uh, in, uh, in our output uh, of this neuron. <clears throat> so this is a so-called blue on yellow off cell. So we assume that this cell type, uh, even though it's not transmitting uh, in the same way as the parvo and magnus cells are, even though it's a small, this one of these part of this, you know, mixture of rare cell types in the retina, yet it's transmitting something that's a, a signal that serves color vision. Uh, down here, here's our magna cell. You can see here, as I remember, I explained to you, very transient responses to brightness uh, changes and hardly any response to color change. <clears throat> so this is one uh, set of uh, cells that, tend to, uh, that we think are sending color signals into the brain. And, and here I'm showing you uh, an, another, uh, an, uh, the previous results were from our laboratory. Uh, but here we've known about this for a long time, since 1966. Uh, the color has been uh, studied here. Uh, you see responses of cell, and you learn now, you, you know, we call these spikes here. So we think of spikes as the currency of the brain. And we can see here we're changing different wavelengths of light. We're uh, illuminating the retina, recording from the LGN uh, during these, for these one second periods, as a function of wavelength. <clears throat> And here is an example of the 
uh, of a blue yellow cell as I showed you before uh, in the previous slide. So as a function of wavelength, these cells are strongly excited by short wavelengths and they are inhibited below the spontaneous rate by long wavelengths. A second class of cells, it turns out these cells are all in the parvocellular layers, are excited by medium or short wave, uh, wave and long wavelengths of light and uh, inhibited by short wavelengths of light. Now look carefully at the different, at the three families, each of these um, graphs shows you th three families of curves and each curve was obtained at a different average illumination. So what can we think, what can we uh, learn from this? That is because this cell, you see that at any, regardless of illumination, this cell is always um, more uh, excited by long wavelengths of light than it is by short wavelengths of light. In other words, if you were the brain and you were monitoring the activity of this cell, you would know, you could infer that what the object in the world on this receptive field is a red or is a reddish object. Likewise, if you are monitoring this cell, because its response is relatively independent of absolute intensity, but highly dependent on wavelength, then you could infer that there was something uh, was reflecting from short wave uh, in the visual world. And so this is an example here of, a, um, of a, a red type cell like this cell here. So you can see more spikes for long wavelengths than for short wavelengths. So this is, these are examples of how we think cell uh, color is being coded at this level of the visual system. We say that these cells show cone opponent properties. That is one set of cones is, um, uh, is exciting the cell and another set of cones is inhibiting the cell. <clears throat> I'll just quickly show you examples um, of, here's a red-green uh, opponent cells from the parvocellular layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus. And we're gonna drift a grating, which changes not in uh, brightness, but only in color from red to green and back again. So you see here, the cell is strongly uh, modulated by color modulation. But the cell, it's a parvo cell. It's getting input. It's a regular midget cell. So it's getting uh, input um, from, uh, not from, uh, it's, it's, it's sensitive to, um, you see, it's sensitive, you'll see that it's also sensitive to brightness change. So these, uh, these receptor, midget receptive fields, they seem to have a red green color signal as well. Uh, as a brightness signal to signal high acuity. So these two functions are somehow combined uh, in the responses of these cells. Uh, here by contrast is a blue yellow cell. So this is our special grading which modulates only the short wave cones and you can see the cell loves it. Look now at the cell's response to brightness contrast. So here we see very little um, response. In other words, if you were the brain, you could tell there was something in the shortwave part of the spectrum, but, uh, but this cell itself is rather, rather insensitive to brightness changes. So it's, it really is color. It's not only color sensitive, it's also color selective. You see, this is the way that neurophysiologists think about the brain. They think about not just the response of something, but how selective it is. So that's our brief introduction to color vision. Uh, I've shown you uh, the principle of uh, what's called univariance, that each receptor is uh, effectively color blind, that the brain uh, integrates the activity of three receptor types uh, to give a full range uh, of color experience. Of, uh, <clears throat> and it's done by judging the relative activation of receptors. I've also introduced you to the idea that there are different color coding cells in the brain and that these uh, in the LGN and retina, uh, the midget cells uh, seem to superimpose a uh, red green color opponent color signal uh, on a signals for brightness, uh, signals for acuity.
Uh, blue yellow cells appear more selective for color as well as being sensitive for color. And both these cell types roughly uh, deliver to the cortex the signals which we, uh, which we interpret as uh, having uh, different color uh, properties. So you know, we know that human color vision is organized in an opponent fashion. So we have one opponent axis which is, long, which is reddish to greenish. Objects in the world don't appear reddish and greenish at the same time. Likewise, objects that appear bluish and yellowish at the same time. But other objects, uh, for example, here, um, uh, <coughs> uh, orange, we think of as a combina some combination of yellow uh, and red. Now, where the signals from these two color channels get recombined uh, in the brain uh, is, this, is still a, an area of active research. It seems that the signal that different cells are put together or mix uh, from different combinations of receptors and it's these different combinations that give us the overall uh, capacity to distinguish so many um, uh, wonderful uh, colors in the natural and uh, in built environment. Okay, so that's uh, uh, quite enough uh, for the day. I hope you haven't um, been um, uh, too uh, uh, overwhelmed by the amount of information. Really, there are many, I hope, some simple principles uh, uh, applying to subcortical vision and to color vision that I hope you can get from uh, my notes. Uh, please think of me uh, as your friend. Don't be uh, shy to send me an email uh, if you have questions, and I'm happy to take uh, questions on this material now.